This is one of those speakers that is adorned by many reviewers and some reviewers whom I'm expecting. I'm expecting, I respect. I'm not editing this stuff. I respect some of the reviewers who like this speaker. But to be honest, I just don't get it. It's not a bad speaker, but it's not a, I mean, I don't even know if I consider it a good speaker. It's an okay speaker. The problem for me is that there's enough things that are wrong with it that ruin my overall enjoyment of the speaker. The very first thing I thought when I fired it up was, man, something's missing in, in the upper mid range. It's just like it did not sound right. And as I kept going through tracks, I consistently noticed that things sounded mellow in the mid range and not the warm kind of sound because warm usually is what happens when there's more mid range presence than there is higher frequency. And in this case, it was kind of the opposite of that. Actually, it was, was the opposite of that where the higher frequencies sometimes were really shouty, particularly the sibilant area from four to eight kilohertz was very sibilant. Every single track that I listened to was especially sibilant. And I, I just don't care for the way this speaker sounds. But I do get why if you don't have a reference, you might like this speaker. And I know that sounds, maybe it sounds condescending and I don't mean it to sound that way. My point is that when you don't have an idea of how something should sound via a reference playback method, either stereo speakers or headphones, something that gives you a good idea of how a recording is supposed to sound via the recording itself, then when something comes along and it's kind of all right, you may pick up on those things, but you may also question your own hearing, or you may think that, oh, well, these other people said that this speaker sounds good, so maybe I just don't know what I'm listening for. And that's the part where I would say, don't be afraid to trust your own gut, which could be come back on me when I tell you that I don't like the speaker and you're saying, well, I love it, Aaron, you're wrong. Okay, cool. Trust your own gut. But what I'm telling you is what I heard. And what I heard is a speaker that is missing mid-range detail, mid-range depth, just mid-range. It's just a suck out in that mid-range area. Now the bass is actually pretty nice. I don't really have a lot of issues with the bass, but the mid-range is my real issue, especially concerned with the upper mid range, lower treble area, because that's just, there's too much. There's some resonances, there's some breakups, there's some issues going on that really stand out and makes that lower mid range just sound recessed. Let's talk about what I heard by looking at the data for this speaker. But before we do, let's just take a quick look at the speaker and I'm gonna run through some specs. This particular speaker retails for about $350 per pair. Now I do see it occasionally on sale a little bit cheaper, but typically that's where the price is gonna be. It is a bookshelf speaker ported, two ports on the front, one inch tweeter, six and a half inch mid woofer. It is very well stuffed and it is also well braced. Here's a shot of the crossover if you wanna take a look at that. And then we'll talk about the crossover slopes later on in the data. The website says that this speaker will fit perfectly in rooms ranging from 15 to 30 meters squared. So most medium sized living rooms, this is what this speaker is designed for in terms of output. And I'd say, yeah, it's probably fine in that regard. Let's go ahead and start looking at the data. All of these data that you're about to see were captured using my Clipple near field scanner. It is a state of the art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data from a speaker in a non anechoic environment. And the reason that that's helpful is because we want to see what's going on with the speaker itself. The impedance, about four ohm. Now the website says that it's rated for eight ohm. And I think actually the back of the speaker says this as well. If you own these speakers, I would be curious to see if you're running these with an AVR. And I think there's a lot of people that probably are going to be running these with an AVR. I'm just kind of thrown off by the fact that I'm seeing some lower impedance around the mid range area, the 200 Hertz area dipping down almost to four ohms. And if I look at the EPDR, it's even lower than that. So I'm really curious if your AVR is powering these speakers or if you're using a separate amplifier. Personally, I would lean more towards saying, 
Maybe an AVR if it's two channel, but don't expect to load it down as a full home theater type setup. Probably gonna need a separate amplifier for that. This is the frequency response on axis with the microphone pointed directly at the tweeter. And we can see that the sensitivity is about 87 and a half decibels at 2.83 volts, one meter. Now this dip through the mid range certainly accounts for what I was hearing in my listening sessions, but this boosting around 700 Hertz to about eight, 900 Hertz, that's interesting. Now looking at the response of the port and the drive unit itself, I don't think that that is any sort of resonance from the port. It could be, but my hunch here is that what we're seeing in this particular area is a baffle step issue and it's just not well compensated through the mid range. Now this dip right here, I do believe is likely the ports causing some out of phase cancellation. And I don't know if it's turbulence from the port. It doesn't seem, at least to me, that the enclosure is resonant. Now I'm seeing a couple little things from that in the data, but for the most part, the enclosure seems well braced, it's well stuffed, and the impedance doesn't show any dips or peaks in that particular area. So on the surface, it looks like it wouldn't be an enclosure resonance. Therefore, my best guess is that it likely is an issue with the ports themselves rather than an enclosure resonance leaking out through the ports. And then going higher in frequency, we've got another dip at around three kilohertz, a strong spike at around four kilohertz, and then a rising on-axis response above about seven kilohertz. Now you can see that this response, while mostly in this plus or minus three decibel range, is pretty much all over the place and it's very inconsistent. And that's why I had such an issue with it. It's just not neutral enough. You know, if one or two of these things existed, that'd be okay. But the fact that you've got a dip followed by a peak, followed by another dip, followed by a series of peaks, followed by a dip, followed by a strong resonant peak, followed by a dip, and then followed by a boosted top end, that's a recipe for disaster if you're looking for neutrality. The F3, 57 hertz, F10, 42 hertz. In the room, the bass was all right. It wasn't mind-blowingly low, but I don't think anybody with any real reasonable expectation is going to expect really low bass out of the speaker, but now you have the data to get an idea of how low it can go. This is the CEA 2034 data on axis. Again, the black line represents the same on axis response that you just saw, so nothing new there. But let's go down here and look at some of the directivity issues. There's a directivity issue at around 1.2 kilohertz, again, likely from the ports, especially because it's a dip. That makes me think it's an out of phase characteristic. I've seen this time and time again with front ports. If the port were on the back and whatever's causing this resonance here was still there, then you wouldn't see a dip, you'd see a peak right here. That's what you can expect. So that's how I kind of have an idea of this is likely, again, due from the port itself, and that's why we're having this directivity error mismatch. Now going higher up, other than that, hey, it's okay, it's not too bad, but then we got a strong swing right here on the directivity around four kilohertz. Why is this here? Well, more than likely, it's where the tweeter is crossed over to the mid-range and it's crossed over way too high. We'll investigate that a little bit more. If I turn the speaker 30 degrees off axis, does it clean up the on-axis response? Does it clean up the directivity errors? Well, I mean, it kind of flattens out the top end, right? Well, we don't have this boost that we have right here on the zero degrees. If I go back to 30 degrees, it, it flattens it out. But the interesting thing is that now you have some mismatch in directivity in the listening window, where the listening window sits on top of the on-axis response. Now we'll go down here, this dip is still there. I expect that to be the case. All these peaks and dips, are, by the way, are all still here. None of them are really affected. And then down here, the directivity is not as severe as a mismatch as it was. If I go back up, you can see that it was more severe and more of a trough through this area. But if I go back to 30 degrees, then it's better. And this kind of goes into what I heard as well. I initially listened to the speaker on axis and I thought the, the top end, there were symbols in some of the tracks that I was listening to and shakers in particular. I can't remember what track it was, but I remember noting, all right, well, this is a problem. That shaker does not sound like it's supposed to sound. But when I turned the speakers off axis by 30 degrees and parallel them with the wall behind it, the shaker wasn't as obtrusive as it had been. So that made me realize that, okay, well, there's a top end spike directly on axis, but if I turn them off axis, that top end is alleviated. But all these other issues, the dip, the peak, the dip, the peak, the dip, the peak, the blah, 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 it's all still there. It's still a nonlinear speaker, even when it's turned 30 degrees off axis. 
Now we'll look at the estimated interim response at zero and 30 degrees, zero in black, 30 degrees in red. And then if I draw a trend line through here, this is another one of those speakers that's hard to draw a trend line for the speaker itself. So what I'm showing you is approximately what I heard in the room. And that matches up. Intentionally, I made this match up because I wanted to show you what I was hearing was a dip in the lower mid range. And then this peaking going on in the upper, well, maybe not so much the upper mid range, but the tweeter area. And this right here, the sibilance area was driving me insane. Horizontal radiation is about 50, 60 degrees. So it's reasonably wide through this particular area. But now what I wanna look at is what's the response off axis relative to the on axis response. And we see it's actually, you know, reasonably smooth, which the directivity index indicated as well until you get to around four kilohertz, five kilohertz. There's a, there's a dip. So there's something going on in that area that's causing a directivity mismatch. Vertical response, you better stay within about plus or minus five degrees. You can go maybe 10 degrees below the tweeter line, but if you go above 10 degrees, that's gonna be a problem. You're definitely gonna hear a hole in the response. It's gonna be even worse than it already is directly on axis. It's not a good thing. Stay on axis with the tweeter. Distortion, it's okay. It's not great. At 86 decibels at one meter, and then at 96 decibels at one meter, now we've got problems. Harmonic distortion is high. Are you going to hear these things? I don't know. I can't tell you that for sure because it depends on a lot of things that I'm not going to get into, but if you're interested, click the card above where I had a conversation with Dr. Earl Geddes about this. The real pointer though is that these kind of things are signs and indications of engineering, not excellence, but maybe the opposite of the word excellence. It just indicates that this speaker needs work in terms of distortion, especially that third order distortion around this one kilohertz area. Notice that's where that dip was on axis and even off axis as well. And I attributed that likely due to the ports. And then we've got stronger second order distortion around here at about two kilohertz as well. So there's a lot of weird things going on with the speaker. And now with the multi-tone distortion, we're hitting almost negative 20 decibels. So this speaker is not gonna get loud. What happens if you use a subwoofer and cross it at 80 hertz? Let's see, none of the upper mid-range distortions changed at all. They're, they're all still there. I mean, the, the spike severity changed, but it's still there. So this speaker has distortion limited output capability issues. And now we look at compression. Let's say we wanted to listen to the speaker at 76 decibels, but we wanted to have 20 decibels of dynamic range because we listen to music that is mixed and mastered well, and it's not limited and compressed all the heck and back. And we were gonna sit three meters away. That means we need to look at the 96 decibel line, which is the blue which says, okay, it's all right. You know, as long as you don't play the speaker too loud above about 80, 70, 60 Hertz, you're gonna be okay within reason. But it is interesting to note that we have some significant compression at the higher output volumes around three kilohertz. Now what's going on here? Let's see. This is the near field components of the speakers measured with the microphone right up on top of the drive units. Tweeters in blue. Woofer is in red and the port is in black. So let's go back and kind of get an idea where the crossover point is. The acoustic crossover point is gonna be around two and a half kilohertz. But we see that this is a really gradual slope. So the crossover slope on this speaker, pretty mellow, I would say. Uh, you know, I have to account for the loss of baffle diffraction here. So we can just kind of look through around here and say there's, there's some weird breakups going on with this speaker above the crossover point. And then the tweeter level doesn't quite seem to be correctly matched. The tweeter needs additional padding. It also needs some breakup control there. This dip right here, I don't know if this is an artifact of the near fill measurement and maybe the port is leaking into this measurement. I don't think that it is, but it is concerning because this should not be here at all. This should be smooth right through here, especially with a near field measurement. And then the port, we see some resonances going on here. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier. This peaking right through here, because the port measures with a peak around 1.2 kilohertz and the ports are on the front of the speaker, that port resonance is causing the woofer's response to cancel out at that frequency. And we can see that in this frequency response measurement. That's what I was talking about earlier. With the strong issues of distortion that I saw around three kilohertz, it's honestly, it's tough for me to say exactly what's driving that. Part of me wants to say that the tweeter slope is too shallow. The other part of me says, well, looks like I've got some kind of breakup mode of the woofer itself going on, but I can't say. Now I did actually measure the other speaker near field 
and I got pretty much the same results. So this wasn't a one-off thing with just a bad single unit. Both of the speakers showed this trait. All in all, part of me understands why people like this speaker, and the other part of me wonders, what the heck are they listening to? And that's the honest truth. I mean, it's... It's neutral enough to be acceptable for some, I'm certain, but for me, the strong variations just jumping from one octave to the next drove me insane, and I just don't like the speaker at all. But having said that, Amazon sells a speaker. I have affiliate links through Amazon. If for whatever reason you still want to buy the speaker to try it out, please consider using my affiliate link because that does help me. I'm not shilling. I don't really like the speaker, but... People will like what they like and they want to buy what they like. And it does come in a lot of different color options. So it is a nice looking speaker. It will take reasonably well to equalization. So if you have something like a mini DSP or your AVR has equalization built into it, it will take reasonably well to that, except for that three to five kilohertz area. That's going to be the problem area because there's a directivity mismatch there. You can't fix the cancellation at 1.2 kilohertz. I don't think that particular cancellation is a big issue. Could be worse, at least it's not a peak, but if it were a peak, you could bring it down, so there's that. All in all, I'm kind of like, eh, on this speaker. If you appreciate this review and you like what you see, please give me a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Please also consider joining me or my Patreon at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. I'm going to be done with this speaker, and I'm going to send them back to their owners now. I'll talk to you later. Peace.